forward uh, to that sharing coming up. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor. How would you compare gold and faith? Gold is precious, but gold is also a metal that is purified in fire. They heat it up until it melts and they skim off the impurities that are on the top. Faith also goes through the fires, the fires of suffering and struggle and just daily life. But I wonder what are the impurities? What in our faith is pure gold and what needs to melt away in you in us, in the church, and in the world. Acts chapter 2 contains Peter's first sermon about Jesus. You Israelites, a man attested to you with power through God, as you yourselves know, this man handed over to you, you crucified and killed by the Romans who are outside the law. Let me count um, you you one, two, three, four, five, six times in just that little short bit of a sermon. Six times, you, 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 you. What's up with this you, you, you? Why not we? Peter was Jewish. Peter was one of them. Peter was there. In fact, Peter was denying he even knew the man that he speaks of. That didn't make it into the sermon. But already, as the early Christian story develops, Already, blame is being placed, not on certain individuals, but on an entire people. This seems to be a problem common, a common problem in the early church. If we just look to John's Gospels, the Pharisees, the crowds, the people are all called the Jews over and over again in John's Gospel. The Jews, the Jews, the Jews, 60 times in John's Gospel. He names the Jews. We call it anti-Semitism, which has been a part of the life of the church since almost its very beginnings. It's not just blame or hate, but it's a loathing that has led to violence against Jewish children of God for the last 2,000 years, including the Holocaust. And even here in Kansas City, the shootings at the Jewish Community Center 10 years ago, and then the march in Charlottesville seven years ago with the ringing chant, Jews will not replace us. This anti-Semitism that so easily creeps into Christian messaging is an impurity that needs to be recognized and burnt away. So what else must change? What else must burn away and be skimmed off of our faith? Do you remember Dr. Jeremiah Wright? He was the pastor at Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, our largest church in our denomination where Jane and Milt were members. For a season, he was President Obama's pastor. He was and is a prophet for our time who certainly has some answers for our questions about what needs to burn away and what must change. I heard Dr. Wright speak here in Kansas City. He only gave a glimpse, but he strongly challenged the privilege and perspective of those who are in power. Those who would insist, my way is the right way or my way is the only way. My way of understanding God, my way of talking about God, my way of experiencing God, my way of saying what needs to be done to please God. My kind of music, my way of singing, my way of learning, my way of land ownership, my language, my manners, my ethics, my way which privileges men, money and wealth, pale skin, and the status quo. So what needs to burn? What needs to change? There's no gold that's set aside that says this is pure enough. It all gets cast into the fire. Everything must be on the table, everything. But 
honestly, that's what got Jesus killed. And that's what Jeremiah Wright was demonized for. Which means that if we dare ask the question or brainstorm some answers or imagine the possibilities, we are opening ourselves up to ridicule and even some time wandering in the wilderness. Do you know the story labeled Doubting Thomas in John chapter 20? Thomas is the only disciple who wasn't there in the room when the risen Christ showed up. And Thomas refuses to believe it unless he can see Jesus for himself and put his finger in the nail prints in his hands and in his side. Silly Tommy. But do you also know Thomas in John chapter 11, nine chapters earlier? Jesus has set his path to Jerusalem following the death of his friend Lazarus. And Thomas is the one who says to his fellow disciples, let us go with him that we may die with him. Yes, Thomas was a man of doubt and a man of courage. Honest, fire-tested faith that is often both. We need to find such courage. In a world of doubt and questions, courage to be, prophetic voices of change, diverse communities of love, humans striving for justice, followers of Jesus who are known as dreamers and weavers of peace. One first century Christian of image was, we have another slide, the phoenix. Do you know the phoenix? Do you know the story and the myth of the phoenix? Those of us who are Harry Potter fans, uh, in the very first book, in the very first movie, he finds himself in the headmaster's office, Dumbledore. Dumbledore is off in another room, and all he sees is this, this frail old bird. And he's looking closer and closer to the bird as the bird begins to shake and then just explodes in this puff of smoke. And then there's just ashes laying there in the birdcage when Dumbledore comes walking in and Harry's just like, I didn't touch it. I didn't do anything. And Dumbledore, well, it's about time that this bird, blah, 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 if you know the story of the phoenix. The legend is that the phoenix grows old, weak, ineffectual, and at that point it will burst into a flame of fire and be reborn out of the ashes. I wonder in what ways the church is old, weak, and ineffectual today. What in the church needs to give way to the fires of Pentecost once again? What in society? What in the church? What in you and what in me? 1 Peter chapter 1 speaks of Easter joy. Blessed be the God and parent of Jesus Christ, whose great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope. This is our new birthright in Jesus Christ, a golden faith refined by fire with each new generation, which rises from the ashes to once again change the world. How easy it is for the church Conservative churches, traditional churches, modern new wave churches, progressive churches, to take that which is beautiful and put right upon our hearts and put guardrails around it and say, you must go through this or you must go through me or you must believe this or it's not really there. What needs to change that our Easter proclamation, Christ is risen, love has won, is still a ringing truth in how we live and how we love. Let us pray. O oh God of the universe and the cosmos, O oh God who created and nurtures each and every person gathered here, those gathered at other churches across the city, and those who didn't even consider going to church today, to those who gather at synagogue or at mosque or wherever it is that they worship, however it is believed, you have created all of us in this rich and wonderful fabric of diversity. How can we who live in this stream of Protestant Christianity be reborn into who it is you're calling us to be for this new day and this new time? 
Help us to look at ourselves honestly and see the ways in which we're getting older and weaker and ineffectual. By your Spirit, help us to identify what needs to fall away that we may truly be who it is you're calling us to be in this new day and time. As both doubters and people of courage, disciples and followers of Jesus still. It is in his name we pray. Amen. I invite you to our closing hymn.